early in my working life, when I was working in a big hospital system, I had a boss who was a self-made woman. She had trained in a, a very old-fashioned way in nursing, but had gone on to get a PhD, had risen in the ranks of this hospital system, was an assistant vice president, uh, and was, was very competent and capable working in an environment where, if we're honest with ourselves, there's a lot of toxic machismo, and she really knew how to work with her elbows out and make sure she was not taken advantage of in any way. Part of that was because she was very pragmatic. If you went to her with any problem or anything, she would find a solution to it. There was nothing that was too hard to fix. That also, however, was part of the problem with her. Whenever you went to her with a problem, she was going to try to fix it. Sometimes that wasn't really what you wanted. Sometimes you just wanted to go and complain or lament. You just needed her to hear what you were trying to say. But you couldn't do it because whenever you came to her with anything, the first thing she was going to do was try to turn it into a solution. So over time, we who worked for her, who admired her very much, nonetheless learned, you don't tell the boss when there's a problem because she's just going to try to fix it knowing that there are times when you can't just fix it, when in fact all you can do is lament and complain and sit with that, has been a really important lesson for me in my ministry, what I've done ever since. If, when I sat in my office with people, and were, I were all, if I were always trying to solve their problems, I suspect I would never really hear the completeness of what they were trying to tell me. Sometimes all you can do is sit with the lament and with a complaint and wait for God. That is really important, I think, when we read the story in the gospel this morning because it seems to be a story with no winners. Everybody in it seems to be sad and lost. Herod, who seems to make drunken promises and has difficulty getting his private life in order, but who nonetheless seems to be very concerned with what other people think of him. Herodias, I should stop for a second and say, this is a com complicated story the way the writer of Mark wrote it. There are two Herodiases, Herodias I and Herodias II. Herodias I appears to be the wife of Herod the king. Herodias II appears to be Herodias I's daughter. It helps that in other versions of the story, she's called Salome. You may remember that from the opera or the play or from some other place. It may help to think of Herodias and Salome. In any case, Herodias, Herod's wife, seems to have gotten herself into a socially difficult position and she appears to resent it and is looking for a way she can smack back at just about anybody. And in the end, has anything really improved in her life now that she's got the head of John the Baptist on a platter? Then there's, there's Salome, Herodias too, whoever she is, this young person, a child perhaps, who seems to have been objectified by adults. She's dancing for men and who also has been pressed into doing something that children shouldn't do, taking on adult problems and trying to be a weapon in the solution to adults' problems. Can't work that way. There's John the Baptist who's in prison. He's been silenced. His ministry has ended. All he can do is sit and wait. There are even all the other people who are at this party, all these guests who are watching this, this family drama play out. Can you imagine what their reaction must have been? This was not what I signed up for or what I thought I was going to get at this dinner party. It seems that the only winner in all of this is evil. And yet, we know that evil is never, in the end, the winner. There must be some grace of God even in this story, and it does come, but I don't want to rush us ahead to that before we sit at least for a time with the lament. And so on this fourth Sunday of the four Sundays, I've been talking about the presence of God. Today, I'm looking for the presence of God in the face of evil. And as I have been doing with the others, I have a few clues that I think may tell us something about where we should be looking in the story. The first is the line, Herodias had a grudge. It seems kind of irrational, doesn't it? John the Baptist has only been telling the truth. He's only been speaking what was actually happening in the world, and in reality, it didn't actually change the situation of Herodias' marriage to Herod. 
she has been using anger to cover up her own embarrassment. She's been redirecting into a bigger sin, what was perhaps a lesser sin to begin with. All of it seems irrational, but seems so very human, the way that we will turn anything and everything into anger if we possibly can to avoid having to confront the more delicate emotions that might have been there first. The second is Herod liked to listen to him, meaning John the Baptist. I wonder whether he was listening or if he was hearing. I, I tell a story on myself in this. Uh, if I know anything about the legal system, it's because I watch or listen to so many trials and legal proceedings on YouTube. When I'm doing the laundry, when I'm making dinner, it's, it's cracking there in the background. It risks becoming wallpaper for me. Periodically, I have to remind myself that these are the real stories of real people, their real lives being played out. And it really can't be for my entertainment. I wonder how much of what John the Baptist was doing ended up being simply for Herod's entertainment. How often Herod stopped to say, oh wait, maybe there's really a message hidden here someplace. And yet how often we use the sadness, the misery of this world as no more than entertainment. The third then is out of regard for his oaths and for his guests. It seems that Herod acts because he's afraid what other people will think. It's worth stopping to ask, well, what were these oaths that he made? You recall that, that, that in its original sense, an oath ends with, so help me God. An oath is really a promise we're making to God most of the time, we who are faithful people. What is this oath that he has promised to God that now turns into the necessity to do evil for the sake of keeping his promise to God. I suspect he wasn't entirely sober when he did it in the first place. That doesn't get him off the hook or us. How often do we, having decided which way we're going to go, become determined to do it regardless of the consequences or new information or anything else or even the better angels of our nature that might be telling us that's really not a good idea. And so with those as our keys and our clues, I can make a few observations about the story. The first and perhaps the hardest for us as modern people is to acknowledge the reality of evil. We as 21st century postmodern people are really good at finding ways to explain away evil. Sometimes we just turn it into a cartoon. I mean, evil is what crawls out of the television in the ring or whatever was the last horror movie we saw. Evil is something so foreign to us and so bizarre, you couldn't possibly miss it. But conveniently, it's also something that almost never any of us have ever seen in our lives. The alternative is to wish away evil as saying that it's simply inappropriate judgment of other people's choices. It's just a psychological thing. It's simply our failure to have adequate perspective. That's not what it is either. I think if we are realistic, if we are honest with ourselves, there is evil in the world and we must name it. We who are followers of Jesus, we who are children of God, if we do nothing else, we must look around us in the world and see where those imperfections go so deep as to be nameable as evil. Call them what they are. If we will not acknowledge that evil is real, how can we ever expect to do anything about it? The second thing that is more complex, perhaps, I got myself in this pretty deep at 8 o'clock, we'll see if I can do better at 10.30, is what Hannah Arendt called the banality of evil. Now, she's been criticized by other philosophers since, and there's some justification in thinking that what she was saying was a little too simple. She, if you don't remember, was writing at the trial of Adolf Eichmann in Israel in the 1960s and was trying to explain how someone who seemed so ordinary could have done such evil things. In the process, she tried to separate out 
whether it's possible to do evil things without being evil. Other philosophers have argued that it isn't really possible. But whatever you may think on that score, I think there is something about evil that is really often very banal, boring, shabby. How many TV crime stories do you watch where everybody is beautiful and their crimes are, are, are elaborate and, and, and exotic and, and very alluring? You know, they, they, they stole Ferraris for a living or something. The reality of evil is often much more squalid than that, but also much more ordinary. It happens all the time in everything that goes on around us, if only we will notice it. I got myself into trouble at 8 o'clock for saying that sometimes it is the softer sins that lead us toward violence. I don't want to suggest that there are softer sins. I do want to suggest there are sins that we would like to think are softer. The mere fact that I envy makes me much better than that person who stole, surely. But no, all of it, dear friends, is the same slippery slope of sin. Let that sink in for a minute, and perhaps that will be the happy thought we carry with us for the rest of the day. The third troubling thing we see in this, the thing that we should lament, is that it seems that evil must recruit. There are many forms of evangelism in the world, I'm sure you know, All the time we are being recruited into one movement or another. We, the followers of Jesus, are only one of them, and often our recruitment is not as successful as some other people's. It would appear in this story that one person's problem necessarily became more people's problem and more people's problem until it was everyone's problem, the sin that everyone saw but no one stopped. All the worse that in this case, adults seem to have have brought a child into the doing of this. They recruited someone in who should have had no part in their problems. We as 21st century people can perhaps imagine how difficult the remainder of Salome's life must have been, having had this happen early on. We should always be looking for the ways that we are being recruited what we are being recruited into. One other. I will confess to you that a month and a half ago when I began thinking about this series of four sermons, I hadn't really intended to talk about the presence of God. I started out thinking I was going to talk about the various kinds of prayer, whether it's the disciples yelling at Jesus, don't you care that we're dying in this boat that's sinking in the first story, or asking for healing for oneself or for someone else in the healing stories in the second week, and so on. There were lots of forms of prayer, except when I read this story for this week, I realized nobody's praying. There is no prayer from anyone in this story. No one is in a conversation with God. How might the story have been, have been different if anyone had been speaking to and listening to God in any way? It is an important message to you and to me, me, dear friends, that prayer is essential. Day by day, in those little ways that form us as faithful people. If we are not listening to the voice of God in our lives, how can we possibly build ourselves up so that we are ready to face the sort of things that come to us in our lives that otherwise seem so much easier to deal with sinfully? violently, evil in evil ways. There's our lament. But I promised you there was also the presence of God in this story. Where is it? I want to suggest to you it comes right at the end in a very quiet way. The line that's almost lost in the story. And when they heard of it, the followers of John came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Here at least is one graceful act in this story. Here is one kind and merciful act in this story. The presence of God comes in as if by stealth, just at the end, 
and quietly. It's not the Armageddon we were hoping for. It's not the, the final battle of good versus evil where evil is struck down so we can see it. It's quite likely that almost no one who was a main character in this story had any idea that the followers of John did what they did or cared. And yet, there is the presence of God coming in quietly, coming in as if by stealth on the edge of the story. That ultimately, dear friends, is how evil is undone. So we come to the end of these four weeks. What have you learned about the presence of God? What have we learned about the presence of God? Where do you see it in your life now, today? I hope if nothing else, it has made each one of us a little more willing, a little more able to notice where God is present on the edge of our consciousness in moments of stress, in moments of joy, in moments of sorrow, even in times of despair. God will not desert us. We have only to notice. Amen.